What's going on guys and welcome back to LOI TV as I, I am joined by Griff and as you can see Cork City winger Dara O'Connor. Dara, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, looking forward to it. I was going to say thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule but uh, that's probably my first question for you. What has your kind of day-to-day schedule been really? Is it more your own individual stuff or is it the club has sent you out stuff to do or? Um, yeah, a bit of both. Um, obviously, I try to replicate a normal training week as best as possible by getting up somewhat early. Realistically, it's around 10 or 11 most days. Um, I don't want getting up at the crack of dawn. There's not much to do for the rest <laughs> yeah. of the day. Anyway. But um, yeah, we're, we're kind of giving around three three running sessions a week, which are kind of spread out on Monday, Thursday and Saturday. And then kind of in between, we have gym sessions in, well, makeshift gym sessions everyone kind of has different facilities at home yeah i'm lucky enough i have a decent set of dumbbells a few suspension yokes pull up bar so i'm kind of surviving in that sense um it's just the actual football that you miss like you yeah can do all the run- you can do all yeah. the running you want and you do feel yourself getting fitter like you're you're kind of giving nearly eight nine out of ten sessions like running wise three times a week which you probably wouldn't get in a normal week in season anyway yeah, yeah, yeah. every season um, so I find my days off. I'm literally just out kicking a ball against the wall. I've a, I don't know if you can see at the window. I'll show you. But um, I brought my goals out to the green there. Yeah, and uh, happy days. <laughs> so I've, been, I've, been, I've, been practice, I've been practicing a bit of finishing, <laughs> make makeshift free kicks. So like it's it's yeah, it's just so, social contact and the actual football that that you, that you miss the most. most yeah, absolutely. Just gonna jump in. So obviously you're playing for Cork now. You're at UCD before. Um. You know, how did you find? Obviously, got promoted with UCD. Uh, why did you pick Cork, really, or how come? You know, Cork was a place that you felt was the best place to kind of move on to after UCD after that promotion. Um, well, I always had a soft spot for Cork as a region, more so than anything. Obviously, with family background and whatnot, there, um, I'd find myself returning to Cork once a month, every two months, particularly summer and Christmas time. Um, I would have went to a few games when I was younger. I always had that kind of soft spot growing up if anyone asked me growing up like once I was in school and whatnot I would have been in Wicklow and if anyone asked me oh who do you support I arguably would have said Cork City like over my local club which probably would have been Bray Wanderers but um, yeah. I didn't obviously get the money game but you'd always keep a look I would have went to the cup finals and support a Cork there and whatnot and ironically enough it was the day after Cork lost to Dundalk in the cup final uh, in 2018 so they played on the Sunday and then Caulfield got in touch with me then on the Monday. So I'd no I'd no idea it was it was on the cards. Um I'd started a masters in UCD in September and the cup final was in the first week of November. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um and then I'd I'd just watched Cork play in front of thirty five thousand people in the Aviva Stadium and less than twenty four hours later their manager was on the phone to me. Yeah. So it was it was a no brainer. I um obviously spoke to the guys at UCD, I spoke to Colly and David McNally, who would have been the more or less director of football. And they they could understand it, but at the same time, I just signed up for a master's, so there was small conflict there, I suppose. How you'd, nothing major, but it was yeah. just a matter of I'd just been placed on scholarship and I was kind of uprooting myself. <laughs> um, but as I said, it was a, not a last minute decision because the window was open till January, but in terms yeah. of college, yeah, it starts in September, so I'd already put in five, six weeks of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, it was a, it was a tough decision more academically than football wise. Football wise, it was a straightforward one. Like I was going to, at the time, the best team, if not second best team in the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it it happened very quickly. I kind of I went down within the first couple, of, within the initial phone call, within two or three days, I was down in Bishopstown getting, getting the tour of Cork in a car with John John Caulfield. And the following Wednesday, then I'd put pen to paper. So it was a quick enough transition, and not a whole lot of college work got done in between. Yeah. So I, kind of, I kind of took a leap. <laughs> took a of, seat, I, yeah. I kind of took a leap of faith. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So just just yeah. going back to your point, when you said obviously going to going from UCD, which obviously isn't famous for its attendance, and then going in front and you know obviously Cork playing in front of thirty five thousand people in the FA Cup final, like was that a big? Or like, how would you even find coping that big step from kind of a like a smaller club to being on a kind of a a bigger scale and a bigger, uh, bigger stage? Yeah, and... yeah, absolutely. Like from schoolboy right up until like oh, getting fifty, sixty points of UCD. I think only once in my life had I played in front of more than two thousand people at a at a max. Like UCD average is nearly two, three hundred, but 
I had one game with the Irish universities out in Taiwan where we played Taiwan in the group stage game. And I think there was five and a half thousand there. And I thought that was just an unbelievable experience. I couldn't get over how yeah. I was like, this is real football. Like, this matters to people. Like, yeah, rather yeah. than just it used to be in a way is nearly like glorified academy football. Like, yeah. compared to 23s in England, like, it's, it's nice. It's nice football. There's good structure. There's a good infrastructure in place. Yeah. But then at, at, the, at the top level, like, there is no community backing. There's no, it doesn't mean a whole lot to anyone outside the college, which yeah, is a I was, shame, I was, but actually, it's just the way it is. Come in. Yeah, I was going to agree and say, because I went to UCD for a bit, and I mean, I dropped out after like three weeks, yeah. but like, I mean, uh, there was no real kind of, uh, you know, even initiative for students to go and attend matches, really, or create a culture. No, they, 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 they tried, like, I, I know a few people in the kind of the social media aspect of the club, and like, they made, they made attempts over the years to bring people in or advertise off free ticket and or buy a ticket and get a free point or they tried different yeah. marketing teams but the demand just wasn't there and they there's no point wasting resources on a demand that isn't there in the first place. So they just kind of they took it as it is. Um it's not as if they're paying mad wages that they need like gates through the door, like do you know what I mean? Yeah, so exactly. If anything they were probably more content in the first division because it was just less hassle more than anything. And um players I mean, got to play and they weren't getting thumped week. and they weren't getting thumped 10 nil by bows now i still stand to this day that if we had kept our like our predominant starting 11 from the first division we would have done really well in the first oh, division. The, some you of the break, players were quality if you game. break the, if you break down some of the players like we had a midfield tree of um gary neil greg sloggett myself was in the 10 we'd frusion jay mcclellan on the wings george mm-hmm. galley up top top Liam scales <laughs> Liam scales maxi josh of center backs connor Kirk, every every single one of them have gone on to top clubs like yeah, yeah, that's insane. Actually, shame. Yeah. <clears throat> that is that. <clears throat> excuse me. That that is one of my like biggest regrets collectively is that we didn't give it a full bash in the Premier Division. Everyone kind of Georgie was the first to leave, then Maxi left, and I went, then Gary version before you know with the spine of the team had dismantled, yeah. which which happens. It kind of resonates with Leicester back in the day when they shocked everyone by winning thing. Everyone's yeah. like, "Oh, yeah. can't they stay?" If X, Danny Drinkwater stayed, Mario's what would have happened? But, I'm yeah. not comparing us to Leicester, but it was a similar kind, of, similar kind of, uh, <laughs> similar kind of scenario like that that unfolded. Like, but. yeah, and then just to move on to the 2019 season, then obviously with uh, your first season with Cork, didn't go uh, as planned. Really, um, three different managers and stuff as well. It's it's, not, it's hard to adapt in those situations. Yeah, I, I I've often said to people that have asked me about this, like I've experienced nearly everything that a season pro would experience in their career of football yeah. in that one year yeah. at Cork. Like. I, Ups, up, very, very, very big highs and then very big lows, like and yeah. everything in between. It was for a twenty-two year, twenty-one, twenty-two year old playing his first season of professional football. Like I was dealt with a lot of different things to go, like not individually, just collectively as a team. Yeah, I, I had to deal with a lot, a lot of things. As you said, a turnover of three different faces looking after you over the course of the year. It's not something you envisage when you sign a two-year contract with the second, with you know, best team in the league at the time. Like, yeah. Um, it started swimmingly, like pre-season, I was still kind of very unknown. Like I don't even think the players knew some of my name at some stage. Like I was just kind of looking up at all these faces yeah. that I'd watched in the cup final and I was yeah, just trying yeah. to get by. And my original plan was just to make a, the the bench make the first 18 for the first game yeah. of the season. It was kind of by St. Pat's, luck, wasn't I think. it? I, think. I, was, I was at that match. I think St. Pat's was the first game of the yeah, season. Yeah, well, yeah. I, kind of, I kind of had the Dundalk game, the President's Cup game. Oh, of course, actually. Yeah. The first game of the season, even though technically it's not a competitive game, although it is. It's one yeah. of those games. But mm-hmm. um, the shield. I, I, like, I didn't start any of the preseason games. Um, maybe a few of the so-called B-team selections I <laughs> made an appearance. Okay. So yeah, like, yeah. the fans didn't even really know what, who I was or what I was about. And it was the game before Dundalk, Carl Shepard got injured. And I came on for half an hour against Longford, did all right. And yeah. he, I don't think they had any choice but to play me against the Dock injury wise. And I had a good yeah. game against the Dock, and that was that. I started and I kept my place right up until I just hit my shoulder. So five games went as best as they could for me, really. Um, and yeah. then dislocated my shoulder. And by the time I came back, Caulfield wasn't my manager anymore. So crazy, yeah. Uh, you actually yeah. finished that season pretty well under Neil Fenn. Yeah, it was a bit of a couple of yeah, positive like, results and stuff. St- started here, summer there, kind of finished around there. So this yeah. season, the plan was to try and maintain this level. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, I've been dealt with another raw hand this year with the coronavirus. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm due one, one clean year of luck. But um, yeah, yeah I, fin- I finished it well. I think I finished with four goals in 10 games under Fenn. So I kind of, we spoke at the end of the season. Obviously, I planned to stay on at a two-year contract. I was just like, look, 
if I could replicate that form of four goals every 10 games, I'd be finishing the season on 15 goals. That would have been enough for a top goal scorer last year. Absolutely, year, yeah. Crazy that way. Yeah, in terms of like the, for this season now, there was an awful lot of turnover and stuff like that in terms of players. Um, how, did you, how did you find that on a personal note, being there from last season? Yeah, I, I, as I, I said, like, I started last season as the young lad, the inexperienced person, nobody knew who I was. Whereas yeah. 12 months later, me, Garrod Marcy, McNulty, and ben, Benno are probably the only remainders with a few young lads like Alec and the boys yeah. coming up from the 19s. Like, so to com- complete, complete switch around. But the average age is so young as well, isn't it? That's the thing, yeah, like, that's the thing. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm starting games as an experienced head now, like, which yeah. is. Like it isn't, it isn't the right thing, I suppose, for a club <laughs> to be looking at. But like, you don't, you don't, you don't look at it from that perspective. You see, because the young lads coming up are very good, aren't they? Like they, they're that. That's that's the thing. Like yeah. the, the young, young, hungry lads is a completely different dynamic from the club, and the fans kind of understand that as well, which is key. Like they, we had great yeah. backing from them starting off. I think we got dealt the raw hand playing Rovers away on the Friday, Dundalk away on the Monday. Yeah, that's tough, days, tough start the very start of the season. Start of yeah. season. It was, no matter what club you are, or what level you're playing at, they're not. You, we just got stitched up, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, just broke up there a tiny bit again. Uh, I'm not sure if you touched on it there, but the Finn Harps result was a good way to bounce back from those two defeats. Um, no, the, the Finn Harps game wasn't the wasn't the beautiful game of football. Bernie Williams, who was lashing rain, uh, yeah. scored a scrappy set piece. Um, but it just showed to the fans that we were there, we were up for the fight. Where at times last year, it probably it probably didn't portray that way. And to be honest. It probably wasn't for a lot of people. They just, I don't think their hearts were in it as much anymore. I don't know if that's fair to say, guys. It's not for me to judge that. Like, but yeah. this season, everyone has a point to prove. Everyone is young. No one's on astronomical wages. Everyone's young, hungry, point to prove. They either didn't work out for them somewhere else or this is their first shot at being a professional footballer. Everyone had their own motives to be as good as they could. And it was, it was coming along. And I think the fans. Our last home game was the one they'll win against um, Harps, and they, yeah. I think the 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 most joy they had leaving Turner's Cross in over a year and a bit, like yeah. that kind of says something. Because yeah. Finn Harps actually started the season brightly as well; like they're they, such a tough team did. to play against. Really, they did, they did, and to be fair to them, they've they've kind of shone shone away from their old nitty gritty style of football. Like they have good footballers, and they're they've definitely McNamee, um, a few other lads up top, like they're. They're not as the the traditional Finn Harps that you know. Yeah. Like they they do try and knock it around a bit a bit more, which is actually easier to play against in a way. Like it's easy to play you. football yeah, against yeah. teams that play good football. It's like Stoke um, kind of when they transitioned a little bit. Yeah, that, yeah exactly. Yeah. Now, but um, yeah, it's just a shame. Like the the Pats game, we we lost one 0 away from home. Probably deserved a draw. So things were coming to fruition eventually, but obviously. Yeah, and obviously, you know, pretty disappointing way to kind of. Well, that was actually the next question. How do you think it's going to finish? Do you think they're just kind of going to cut off the rest of the season, or how do you? How would you like to see it go, in your opinion? Like just talking like, behind I, closed doors, isn't there at the moment, or something like that? Games being played. Look, I I'd, I'd play any game of football right now. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, I think a lot of footballers will be in that mindset. It's the behind closed doors game is more probably going to affect financial perspectives and fans perspective more than the players but at the end of the day once you're on the pitch you're just on the pitch you're going to do your job as best as you can obviously an atmosphere yeah. is an added bonus and whatnot I'll be at an advantage I've had four years of senior football playing behind closed doors effectively anyway <laughs> yeah um, you. as will a lot of our 19 so like for the most of our team they haven't really been used to playing against crowds like the lads that came over from England like I'm living with the four lads from London. Like they're not used to playing in front of big crowds either. Like they couldn't believe turning across when we came for, when they first came over. So yeah, from a team point of view, it's probably not going to affect us as much as it'll affect other teams if it is the case. Yeah, I get um, you. But look, the PFA are in touch with us kind of weekly about what they're trying to do. Um, I think they're trying to come back in June behind closed doors, stream the games if whatnot. But yeah, there's a there's a lot of variables to go on there. Like if if it's not safe for fans, how's it safe for us? Like yeah. Some play- teams that have players that have wives, kids, living at home, they're not going to go out and play in front of 22 sweaty men and come back then to their families. Like, it's different yeah. for lads like myself who can stash off by themselves. But <laughs> ev- everyone has yeah. different circumstances. Like, And you said you said very about the few lads from London. They're, they're on, a lot of them are on loan, aren't they, as well? So is that, is, has that been right. affected as well? And so yeah, so we've... Uh, Rayon and Henry are, are London-based. They signed for the year. And then we've... Yeah. 
jo- Joseph and Kyron are over from Arsenal and Wimbledon. They're on loan with yeah. Joe Redmond, then obviously with Birmingham and Deshaun as well from QPR. So whether they stay or not, like I, I think from a personal point of view, they'd like to. Obviously, mm-hmm. it could be out of their hands. Like um, the loans were meant to be up in June. Yeah, it's up in the air, um, basically. Yeah. Yeah, well, like I've I've been asking them, but to be fair, I don't even think they know themselves. Like I think yeah. it'll probably come down to whether their parent clubs want them to go back out and loan, or whether they want to come back in for pre-season at their own clubs. Which is a shame because it is effectively our back line. Like um, yeah. our two centre backs and our right back were on loan, so, so I don't envy our, our gaffer's job of having to reallocate players if that, <laughs> if that is the case. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you quickly as well about um just uh just from a, as you're probably a top league of Ireland player like if seeing Stephen Kenny going into the Ireland job is that like a big motivating factor not like probably not something you're sort of focusing on right now but uh in terms of like just maybe for a few, couple of years time or something like that is that like a positive thing for you that he might be be more inclined to yeah. pick league of Ireland players? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think it's probably crossed every league of Ireland footballers um, mind at some stage. I think they'd be lying if they said they weren't. Yeah. Um. I think the biggest change here would probably be the style of football, um, which I should hope would influence kind of um, picking more technical players than your more robust kick and run kind of players. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I obviously don't think it'll happen immediately. It'll have to be a slow transition. Um, but like the gap, as shown by players that have made the step up, obviously if they're, if they're blitzing the League of Ireland, they seem to be doing all right, doing all right. Like I think if yeah, Shawnee yeah. got a big Shawnee Maguire got a better chance under Mick, I think he would have thrived because when he did get in, um, he did what he did well. Likewise, yeah. Jack Brown. Obviously, some of them are token gesture games, so it's hard to tell at the 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 crunch games whether whether yeah. they're up to it or not. But yeah, I I do think even if he a few of the I don't want to call them meaningless friendlies, but like some of them they're just they're dead friendlies. Not many people go to DB, but oh, I think if yeah. he, if well, I don't know if it's in the pipeline or not, but if they did make a League of Ireland eleven, I think it happened years ago, they played Man United, but something like that would be an added motivating factor for a lot of the players because if, if you're picking a, an 18-man squad or a 22-man squad for a League of Ireland eleven, there's probably around 50 to 60 players in with a contention there. And that Definitely. will just dr- drive the standard up even more within the league. Like So little incentives like that, even if it was once a year, yeah. they were like, look, we're, we're going to play you know, Georgia, Iceland, Eng- England, Scotland, whoever it is that are going to be playing in friendlies if they said, "Look, we're putting a League of Ireland eleven out there." Brilliant idea, yeah. You, you what? Do you know what I mean being an yeah. incentive and definitely? I don't think they should put they should put a, an age limit on it because I think that was the case before. It was under twenty three or something like that. I'm not too sure, but yeah, it's look. I'm not generating the idea. I think it's been tossed around a few times. But, yeah, um, yeah. That's yeah. I, I do think it, it could. That's, that's really I do think it could be. Then. That's the thing. Like, is a League of Ireland player going to just? slot into the starting eleven of the main Irish team. It's debatable, like realistically. Yeah. Unless he's completely ripping it up like Jack Burr yeah. or something, maybe. That's about it at the moment, probably. That's the thing. Time time yeah. will tell. Like I'm sure Stephen Kenny has his eye on a two or three players that are definitely yeah. capable of the step up. I think that he'd be more he'd be more ballsy in his choices than maybe Mick was. He was more kind of conservative, which yeah. worked yeah. work for him obviously. Just to finish off there, we've a few quick fire questions, that's all right with you. Shoot, no yeah. problem. Uh, so the first one is the best player you've ever played with. I've ever played with. I played with Harry Wilson when I was on wow. uh, Liverpool under fifteen. Quality was he? Um, free kicks and all. Yeah, he, he, was, he was a joke. <laughs> I played. I played against him the year previous in the Hibernian Trophy. I was playing with Joey's, and he played with Liverpool. That was my next and question: was, the hardest opponent would he be? That as well, nearly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when I say opponent, I didn't. Well, I played against him, but like I was yeah. playing in the ten, he was playing yeah, left wing. Like yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, hardest opponent. Um, I, I, you're gonna forgive me. I actually don't know his name. But it was, it was against you. <laughs> it was against. He was Ukrainian, and I played against him on the 19s with the Irish team down in Marketsfield. If you want to do your research after, you might yeah, be able we'll to find it. <laughs> um, he was playing in the Champions League at the time with Don Don I was playing right wing, and he was playing left back. And I spent the game just playing like a second right back for us. I was just wow. camped back. He just kept bombing on, bombing on, bombing on. Then the following week, he was playing in the Champions League. That's nuts. Yeah, that, that's crazy. That, that, that makes sense. 
Um, he was re- he was redheaded player left back for Ukraine. We'll, we'll find we'll find the name. You, 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 Ukraine, you, you, I'm pretty sure we'll find them. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's some long name that I can't pronounce. But, uh, he he was a joke. Like I still have nightmares trying to defend against him. When I was playing right back. <laughs> I was playing right wing, and he was left back. Like next one is uh, the funniest person in the Cork dressing room. Funniest person, probably Mark McNulty. He's just you never believe a word he says. Like he's he's a player coach now, isn't he? <laughs> He is, yeah. Like he's he's in our he's in our dressing room half the time. He's in the staff room half the time. Like he's yeah. in and out. He's probably ripping up both both. Great, great character, trying, like trying to take a piss out. Oh yeah, like last year I think we were meant to go into the our training in Bishopstown, and we have a gym in Bishopstown. We have a gym in Myrdock, so we it altered. Some days we're there, some days we're there. He told half the team we're in the Myrdock when we're actually in the Bishopstown. So <laughs> he just loves throwing chaos out. Like you, you have to learn oh, not man. to believe a word he says. Like yeah. <laughs> Uh, the favorite, your favorite goal you've ever scored. Favorite goal, favorite goal I've ever scored probably was actually against Cork for UCD under 19. So I got the ball at the halfway line, kind of took it down the line, cut in. It's on my Instagram if you scroll way back, um, and it just flies into the top corner. Favorite proper goal, like not underage football, would probably be UCD in the Collingwood Cup final. The just last minute winner, wasn't it? Yeah, just the the whole scripture behind that, like that. It was the ninety fourth minute. Our legs were hanging. We played four games in four days. We were about to go to extra time. Oh, Jesus, yeah. It was one. It was one all. We were down to ten men, and just the way that goal went in, like just it was more relief that we didn't have to do extra time than we won. <laughs> That's why yeah, everyone was exactly. so happy. If you if you watched the video back, everyone was just delighted, but more so that we didn't have to do extra just time. Just a relief. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, who was your favorite player growing up? Um, like I'm a I'm a Messi fan over Ronaldo all day long. Would you be? Yeah. Admi- I admire Ronaldo. You have to like, and in his Man United days, I probably would have tried to been copying him as free kick stars and whatnot. But I just think <laughs> he's turned into more of a an elite goal scorer than an all round footballer at this stage. Um, which I'm sure we'll get a few remarks. But Messi was just a total footballer for me. Like, and Alexis Sanchez from a, obviously I'm not going to replicate Messi. Just a complete different level. Like. But yeah, yeah. when Alexis, prime Alexis Sanchez or Hazard, that kind of a jinky player that just tries to cause havoc in the final third, can play left wing, right wing, 10. That's kind of my, my ideal scenario. So I would have would have based myself off prime Hazard or prime Sanchez. Yeah. And just the final question we have for you. Um, you might have already answered it, to be honest. Uh, your best moment in football? Best moment in football was probably the professional debut for Cork against Dundalk in the President's Cup. It was... Um, Four and a half thousand people in Turner's Cross. So it was my debut. I had a decent game. Um, even though we lost, ironically enough, um, it just the whole experience. Like I remember shaking in the dressing room before the game. I could just hear the crowd above me in the shed. Like I'd never Crazy. had that before. Yeah. And I was like, right, just go out, give us six out of ten. Just don't mess up. Don't yeah. let them leave <laughs> the stadium. Yeah. Being like, don't don't let them don't let them leave the stadium. Being like, who is this absolute rookie? Like, <laughs> um, do enough. And, and it, it, it is like it was it was a completely different um, like scenario. I've never been in that environment before. So I just even like in preseason, you get a couple of hundred of people in cross. I didn't know how to get in there my first game for Cork. Like I was asking stewards where to go and all. Um, <laughs> Because obviously you, you you drive up yourself and you park wherever you can get parking and turn it yeah. across. So I'd rock, I rocked up by myself, not knowing where to go. Like they probably thought I was a fan with a gear bag. But um, <laughs> no, just that whole that whole day. Like result aside, everything else went to plan. I had a, I had a good game, uh, unbelievable atmosphere, and it was just kind of a what I thought was going to be kickstart for an unbelievable season, and it started that way. Obviously, before what I touched on before, yeah, kind of went yeah. wrong. Listen, Dara, thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. Thanks no, so much. Thanks very Cheers, much. Mate. Talk to you a bit. Mate.